Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, Ladies and Gentlemen, let me switch to English right away, since uh, I don't think I want to try this in Italian and I don't want to offend our speaker and our guests from the Italian embassy here as well, so I'll try in English. Uh, welcome to today's Academy Lecture, Eduard Seuss Lecture. Um, our speaker today is a foreign member of our Academy here, uh, Professor Alessandro Montanari, who we all know as Sandro. Um, he is the director of the Geological Observatory of Col di Gioco, which is a private research institution uh, in the Marche region. Uh, of Italy, um, an area that you may have seen lately in the news as partly affected by the terrible rainstorms and floodings. Fortunately, his area was spared mostly. Sandro is a renowned uh, Italian geologist. Uh, he has studied first at the University of Urbino in Italy, Uh, and then he moved to the United States of America, where in 1986 uh, he received his uh, doctorate in uh, science there at the University of California in Berkeley. He worked with a world-famous geologist, American geologist, who had been working in Italy, and this is how they met, Walter Alvarez. Uh, Alvarez may be known to some of you as the person who confirmed that there was an impact event about 66 million years ago that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs and about 70% of all other living species on Earth at that time. And Sandra was researching some aspects of this big impact event and the geological record of that impact event in Italy and elsewhere, mainly also in Mexico. Eventually, he returned to Italy and uh, founded uh, this research institution in 1992, where he has mainly been engaged, on the one hand, in scientific research, and on the other hand, in a lot of outreach in form of educating students and running field courses from, for students from all over the world, um, and hundreds and hundreds of students from various universities in Europe and overseas have been uh, in that area. And that is a geologically very interesting area, the Umbria Marche sequence, where we can learn a lot about past geological events on Earth. Sandro has written many, many research papers, hundreds of them, including some books, uh, at least one of the books we did together years ago about the impact stratigraphy in Italy. Um, he is a fellow of the Geological Society of America. He uh, received the European Geosciences Union Jean-Baptiste Lamarck Medal. Uh, he has a fellowship from the European Commission. And in 2010, he was elected a corresponding member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. It is fitting that he would give a so-called Eduard Seuss lecture today. Eduard Seuss was a polymath in terms of geology. Uh, many of you may know him as the father of the uh, Vienna water pipeline system, the Hochquellenwasserleitung, that we thank the wonderful water that we have in Vienna for. He was a paleontologist starting out at the Natural History Museum in Vienna, then worked at the University of Vienna, and eventually became president of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And he has worked in many different topics, including early versions of tectonics uh, and uh, continental development and so on. His famous book, Das Antlitz der Erde, The Face of the Earth, which was published in three volumes in the early 20th century, remained a classic for a long time. Sandra is a polymath in a very similar way, and eventually maybe there will be some lectures named after you as well. We'll see. Now, uh, he will lead us to uh, the so-called Frassassi Caves that are in central Italy in the Umbria Marche region. 
a little bit uh, inland from the large port town of Ancona. And they are truly fantastic and beautiful caves. Those of you who haven't seen them yet, uh, I know Sandra will show some pictures. I assume you will be interested. And if you ever make it in that part of Italy, which is very easy to get to, go and see those caves. They are absolutely spectacular. But they're not just spectacular to look at. They are of great importance and have been over the last decades for scientific research, for topics that range from better understanding of the uplift of the mountain system of the Apennines to the discovery of interesting species that live specifically in caves, from the study of the possible record of geomagnetic reversals in stalactites mites and stalactites and so on and so forth. And Sandra has been involved in such research for decades now. And in fact, he is one of the co-discoverers of that cave system, something on the order of half a century ago. But in the academy, we usually think in long timescales. So with that, I'll give the floor to Professor Sandra Montanari and uh, would like to remind you that afterwards there's a chance for discussion uh, and then a formal discussion up here, and then we move downstairs and we'll have some drinks, courtesy of the Academy uh, and uh, the Committee of Geosciences of the Academy, which I happen to chair here. Uh, and so you'll be invited to that as well. For, for now, Sandra, the floor is yours. Well, good evening to everybody, and uh, I want to just to say how um, honor I am to be here and be able to speak about the caves uh, to all of you. I did such a beautiful place like is Vienna, and particularly the Academy of Science of Austria. And uh, so, the scientific marvels of the Frassassi Caves in central Italy. Oh, well, the scientific marvels, okay. Now, I wanted to introduce you to just a little announcement that um, uh, we have a Col di Gioco, uh, the Geological Observatory, produce an e-book uh, in a format of a PDF, 300 pages, 275 figures, 20 uh, short uh, movies that can be um, uh, downloaded for free at that uh, uh, website, right? In the internet. And it is called uh, Frassassi, The Little Big History of the Caves. And this book... Uh, has uh, parts, that is, uh, the initial part is about pedagogy. Pedagogy of what? Of uh, the big history, not concept, which is now a movement, an international movement, that wants to introduce the concept of uh, teaching big history of the world, actually of the universe, right? From the Big Bang to this moment, uh, into mid and high schools. So this book actually is a tool for teaching. And of course, and then there are uh, chapters. They are dealing with the big history of the earth, the big history of life, and the big history of humanity as seen from the perspective of the case. So that's why it's called the little big history. Little big histories are local big histories. No, and so it is a new way. And the English version of this book is going to be ready uh, in a one month or so that you can freely uh, download. So now, the touristic marvels of the Frassassi Caves in central Italy. No, here there is a little map that shows you the white dot where is the cave in respect to Ancona. And... Um, mm, uh, you just go no, www.frassassi.com and you will find millions of photographs, beautiful, incredible photograph of this incredible cave. This incredible cave, which only one small part of it that you see 
uh, right, I echo right here, is, uh, is now a show cave, a commercial show cave. But the actual cave complex is actually 30 kilometers. So that is just a one hour tour for tourists. And uh, you can uh, assess there, it's extremely well organized. And uh, as you enter in the cave from uh, this uh, uh, tunnel, no, you already start, uh, you see right away what is the grandeur of this cave. Imagine that, uh, that uh, picture you see down you know, to the left, that is the big rooms that is bigger than a football field. No, it is 260 meter high as a volume of 1 million cubic meters, right? And that's what you see the first thing entering there. And you see uh, on the right of that picture, gigantic stalagmite, 25 meters high, 8 meters in diameter, a group that called the giants, right? But then as you go on, you'll find the other uh, incredible, more secluded, uh, beautiful, decorate, beautifully decorated stalactite, stalagmite, uh, flowstones, crystals, uh, crystallized lakes, and all through this uh, this tourist uh, percourse, right? But just by looking at that, you now you already see, for instance, that map, the little map up to the right, the uh, the caves, you know, is uh, all developed in uh, rooms which are elongated, you now uh, along uh, uh, northeast, uh, southwest uh, direction. Uh, the north there is uh, being uh, twisted, or in another direction. And those because that caves just form on a grid of fractures and faults that is being formed while the Apennine has been uh, uh, formed and uplifted. So already there, you see that there is, in fact, a record of the geological history of this part of the Apennines as has been uh, impressed and written in this cave. Okay, here is the panoramic view, right, uh, of, um, of the area. You see there that there is a big mountain there, now with a rounded top that is caught and now by a deep gorge, a 600 meter deep gorge, at the bottom of which there is a little river, Centino River, that flows through. And it is the, the Centino River that actually caught that gorge. And that block of rocks that you see there are this uh, dense and compact and hard, uh, pure limestone of Jurassic age called Calcare Massiccio. Now, in, uh, in a cross-section, uh, very simplified, but actually in scale and everything, you will see that that blue formation, you see on the right, which is a pure calcium carbonate, actually sits on top of uh, the, that purple formation, which is a trace evaporite, basically containing gypsum, calcium sulfate. And uh, all the, uh, uh, the block there, th through a fault, has been pushed toward east, right? Squeezing the deformation, there are multi layers straight uh, of Jurassic and Cretaceous age, into a very tight fold in the front that is, we call it a syncline. Uh, back in the Jurassic, the, the, the big anticline, half anticline that we see now, actually used to be a horst. Right, a seamount, whereas uh, the syncline used to be a graben, which means a deep basin. So this squeezing, however, with that fault, caused waters rich in uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide, H2S, um, uh, which is sulfuric acid, to actually comes up, up well, well up and encounter the oxygen rich, uh, rich water of the water table, basically at the river level. And that uh, caused a reaction uh, between H2S rich water and oxygen rich carbonate water that caused uh, the formation of sulfuric acid, which is a very potent acid that actually has carved the limestone and dissolved the limestone below the water table, making this, uh, this uh, cave system. And you see here you now a cross section of the cave system 
of the old credit system, and you will see that it is, uh, is uh, distributed in floors, in horizontal floors, down to base level. To the right, you will see the Frassassi Gorge with the Centino River, and uh, those floors are there, one or another, because while the, uh, the, the uh, uh, oxygen, uh, the um, sulfuric acid, now dissolve the limestone below the water table, the entire mountain is being uplifted because of the formation or organic formation of the Apennines. And so you have various phases of that making different floors of the cave, right? Uh, getting from uh, present day at the water table all the way up to hundreds of meters. So now very briefly to see how this thing happened. Well, if you go, uh, we go back uh, 20 million years, we had uh, this uh, situation in the Mediterranean. We had uh, 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 Africa, Europe, and a promontory Africa in the middle, no? that had been pushed no? because of convergence between uh, Europe and Africa to actually collide and form the Alps. But around 20 million years ago, a block of Europe rotated counterclockwise, including Sardinia, um, uh, Corsica, and even Calabria, and that will have uh, squeezed all the sediment that through 250 million years has been deposited in this uh, promontory of Africa that we call Adria. And that will have caused, in fact, in the center image, basically the formation of this anticline and of all these syncline folds and faults, while everything was uplifting. If you squeeze something, that, that something gets thicker, and so will actually uplift. And there, the, on the right side, the model of how the uplifting actually will have caused while these anticline synclines were forming, migrating toward the east, uh, when the river were actually flowing tranquil up there, they actually being caught by the river while these uh, anticlines were growing. So, and this is how we got, you know, our gorge with the caves, right? So, that is the real situation of infrasaxa, which is the Latin name of frasassi, which means in between the stones, frasassi, Infrasaxa. And there we have a tectonical leaf. A mountain goes up and river stays still where, where it is. It can't, it, the only thing it can do is to cut. No? Instead, you have uh, the infra emmental where the thing is, you know, you get a knife and uh, you cut the cheese. The knife cuts down and the cheese, you know, with the caves, the holes, stay still. So, the infrastructure, this is the way they form, and today all those black dots are basically the cave system that is being cut. And so they are now natural entrances to the actual cave complex, which I said is 30 kilometers. So with this mechanism, at any time while the thing is growing and cutting the cave uh, system, what happens? Happens at a certain point there is an entrance that is at the same level of the river, and every time the river floods, now the muddy water enters in the cave and then goes all through the cave and will deposit the sediment load, which as you go far from 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 the entrance become silt, become a clay. And we found those deposits way like a kilometer and a half from the entrance of the cave in deposit, just like you see on the left uh, image, that, uh, that uh, we have cored you know, with a simple core. And then you see that there, uh, those are stratified. There are dark layers and light layers. The light layers are actually calcite that form in the water table of the cave. Whereas the dark layers are actually this muds and silt that has been brought by several successive floods. And so by dating <laughs> those uh, calcite, we can have uh, now a chronology of uh, the fluvial flood that happened in that period of time. And by doing 
a stable isotope oxygen at, and, and a carbon also an idea of what were the environmental conditions outside the cave. But then what, what happened? The, 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 the entire mountain goes up, 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 and that deposit that once used to be at the same river level, now we found it 200 meters above river level. And so we find these deposits, and that are also tracer of what is the uplifting rate of the entire uh, mountain there. And so by doing dating, dating this deposit through different techniques from optically stimulated luminescence, or in some cases we also use uh, radiocarbon or cosmogenics, you know, beryllium 10 or uh, aluminum 26. Here that we see in this uh, simple graph where you have uh, a time, right, at the bottom, and meters above present level, you can actually trace a curve, and you realize right away that uh, in the far past, uh, uh, before 100,000 uh, years ago, the uplifting rate was only 0 0.3 millimeter per year. Whereas in, uh, in, uh, in more recent time, like now, presently documented by geodetics, the uplifting rate is twice as that. So that means that at a certain point during the tectonic evolution of this thing, basically there has been an acceleration of the tectonic activity. And you know the tectonic activity uh, is equal earthquakes, is equal movements. And uh, we all know that these northern Apennines are quite a seismic um, uh, place. But then, <coughs> The fact that we have uh, this hydrogen sulfide coming up, mixing with the, with the oxygen product, then it will cause an environment in the groundwater, in the deep water, uh, very, uh, very particular. Basically, these caves have, uh, lakes in the middle, uh, even the farthest part. They can be even 30 meter deep. And what happened is that in the deep water of those lakes, the water is sulfitic, is just full of iron sulfide. There is no oxygen. We have first tested, you see the little uh, yellow and blue graph, by putting their marble uh, probes down to seven meter and discovered that the marble probe after one and three years actually got lost weight, they got dissolved. This is where the uh, corrosion of limestone happened today. And, uh, and instead, in the upper uh, layer of water, which is co totally carbonate, the, the, these probes of marble actually has gained weight. This is where the karstic uh, uh, process is actually normally is happening. So the only thing was to actually go down there and figure out what was going on in, the, in this underground, underwater thing. So we sent down, down one of our scuba, uh, speleo scuba diver, and down there he, this guy found huge environments with forests looking like trees or big ropes like this with branches. So you see them there made of bacteria. And among them, all these weird animals going around there. Now, that was an entire Martian uh, uh, ecosystem. And I saw chemoautotrophic ecosystem. Uh, 15 years of studies. Here we found out uh, that in these caves, there are all different kind of organisms where they all live on this chemoautotrophic, what it means, instead of uh, 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 phototrophic, meaning photosynthesis, these bacteria, no, they perform chemosynthesis. They get the energy to build them, to create themselves, no, from the energy released by the oxidation of H2S, or uh, that, that forms, uh, um, uh, uh, they form uh, sulfuric acid. And so they get the uh, energy from that reaction. But then doing that, they build a biomass, 
which is food, which is protein, which is sugars, which is anything. And so there are a bunch of other organisms, they eat on that. And they're not photosynthetic, they're chemosynthetic. They don't need the sun energy. They live underground in this particular extremophile, extreme environment. And so they are protozoans, like 15 different uh, species. Uh, uh, Platel mantis uh, uh, species, uh, worms, annelids, nematodes, rotifers, ostracos, uh, gastropods, little snail, and amphipods, and copepods, and every, every kind of pods, ipods. They're all uh, there, no? In this ecosystem that is independent from the solar energy. Okay? And guess what? Most of these species are unique and endemic of this cave. And for the first time, it defied. But then the cave, as I was saying, you know, uh, is uplifting, uh, tectonic activity. So there are earthquakes. And, dang, and these earthquakes you now also get registered in the cave. Look at this case here. This is a, a room uh, where there are beautiful spellothemes, uh, stalactite, stalagmite. And all those red little cigar shaped uh, uh, symbols there, those are pretty large uh, stalagmite that has been knocked down you know, to the floor. And the floor is flat. So what happened there? They look, if you look at them, they all have the same direction. That means that it's been knocked down by a sheer wave or an earthquake that was coming from that direction. Now shake it, shake it, they, and we found those things laid down with the actual, see the lower right, the, the stump and the actual fallen stalagmite. By measuring, uh, now we are in the process of dating now the, the collapse uh, through the new spellotheme calcite that has been formed on the stump. Now, then we are going to figure out when this big earthquake actually happened. So, and, uh, but this, this spellothem and climate, uh, see, the spellothemes are formed by water coming from the atmosphere, going rainwater that goes through the soil, and then uh, goes into fractures and uh, basically uh, collects uh, uh, calcium carbonate, you no, know, because uh, CO2 actually created carbonic acid. Not very potent, but enough to actually make a cave. Once that drop is, uh, saturated with calcium carbonate, we'll find the space of the cave and we'll make the stalactite or the stalagmite, right? And so, and that goes on and on and on and on. And one of these fallen stalagmite, uh, here you see it, which uh, we have dated at the bottom and at the top. So the stalagmite records this dripping for from 11,000 years ago to 4,000 years ago when actually knocked down, was knocked down by the earthquake. And look at the inside. Inside you see all the accretion of new calcite, dark and light layers, and you see how they are cyclic. Actually, they are rhythmic. And even the entire spine of the stalagmite actually has a wave, which is wavy, meaning that not much, uh, that, that the cave was, <laughs> was, was uh, shaking, but is that the drop was actually slightly moving from the dripping point because uh, of climate. Why? Because more rain and so more direct. Less rain, less dripping, and so the dripping actually will occur a few centimeters to, to the side. And in the details, those other things show you that there also there are unconformities. Um, uh, Angular and conformity. So this thing whole here, by then starting with a multiple approaches like clumped isotopes, which would give us the exact temperature uh, of the environment or the cave <clears throat> from this pellet thing to the uh, one tenth of a degree Celsius, will actually allow us to reconstruct the climatic history of this region, at least in the stalagmite for the past 11,000 years. And then in the cave, we found the presence of men. The same room in the rest square, what we found next to this giant stalagmite that we call it the totem, just ne next to it, to the left, 
a fireplace. A fireplace. Now, this room can be now accessed only from the inside because the exit, which is up to the left, is blocked by a landslide outside, right? So, but that was open once and upon a time. And so people were getting into the cave, walking in the darkness for 60 meters to reach this large eh, and lit up their uh, fireplace. And next to here, there, there was a stalagmite when it was discovered. You see the picture there. The Spelunkers in 1985 from my Spelunky group. That they discovered a skull of, of, of a mountain goat over a stalagmite, right? And so, and around there, tools. And we dated, of course, that. And that happened to be uh, a big ritual place, a worship place, now of 16,300 years ago. Hunter-gatherers, you know, they were going around hunting in the Frasassi area. Now, stratigraphic record of the Younger Dry's climatic event, no, 12,000, from the Grotta di Baffoni, Cave of Frasassi, Marcadino, which is an analog for the current climate change. And here is a research that I've been doing with Christian Kerbel, and I will explain you what happened there uh, from our cave research. So what is the Younger Dry's? The Younger Dry is the last severe, dramatic, drastic climate change that we, uh, we can recall. And it happened at around 13,000 years ago. Why do they call it Younger Dry's? Because in the sediments of that time, which indicates that the, uh, at least the Europe, you know, Mediterranean got out of the last ice age, you know, with pollen indicating forests. See, all of a sudden, those sediments, no more forests, no more nothing, but only these driest family of flowers, they only grow in a dry, cold tundra or in a high elevation thing. They are called driest. And the, uh, the, there's been a big controversy that there are some people starting with the firestone that says, oh, the younger drive was caused by the impact of a, of a meteorite, but phew, showing no evidence you know, of any impact, any crater, anything, or wrong evidence. And uh, Krista knows more about that than I do. And uh, or also were detonators saying, oh, well, you know, the younger rise actually was caused by the explosion of a super volcano in the middle of Germany, so-called the Lachersee Caldera. And I'll explain you. Again, this is another cave, Grotta dei Baffoni. is a simple cave, 50 meters long, big entrance, Atra room, nice and flat, ramp and then down there. And uh, we have been studying exactly for the same reason of figuring out the history of sedimentation in this case, and tectonic. And uh, this cave was actually excavated in 1953 by a famous uh, archeologist at that, that time, very young. And uh, we basically uh, have found defines bones and um, artifacts in this four meter deep excavation in the entrance of the cave and able to actually find define the bones itself. And so basically we're able to give a, a chronology of uh, this sedimentary sequence down there, down to four meters and going from 40,000 years ago to basically modern to, to present. But down there in the bottom, okay, there must have been a little lake. This little lake, right, uh, actually is now there is a crossed uh, spellow theme, but once you break the cross below the cross, there is a soft sediment. Soft sediment, just like the one I show you uh, early on, and a soft sediment, and there there is a little uh, section, and you see that this sediment is stratified below the white calcite, there is a brown, red, uh, brown, dark gray, and so on. And there we did also with an auger. So we date everything the possible datable. But the important thing that the layer just below the calcite cross that was basically when the lake dried up, left this cross, there is a layer of silt, you know, the travel material containing pebbles, containing gastropod shells, containing bones of small uh, vertebrates, right? 
and lizards, bats, etc., which has been washed down from uh, the entrance of the cave down to this little pond. And also pieces of charcoal. And the age of those charcoal came out to be, you know, 12,843 years ago, which is the peak of the Younger Dryas. You know? And but that tells us only that there must have been some people in this cave that, because it was damn cold, you know, that actually was making fire, you know, because the Younger Dryas uh, entail the fact that out of the last ice age, in the northern hemisphere, the condition became to like uh, the last glacial maximum. Basically, everything was frozen. So it was, we were in a periglacial area, it was very cold. And so there, we reconstructed that from that, uh, that charcoal. Now, what is interesting, because of the controversies of the, the, the bombardiers, meteorite people, and uh, the, the Lacher Zay the caldera supervolcano, is a controversy that is still going on today. Well, and, uh, not long ago, there was this team in uh, Texas in a cave very similar to this cave in Frassassi, Grotta dei Baffoni, that they made uh, an excavation of going down four meters just to look at these uh, stratified sediments and reconstruct basically the history of uh, the environment outside the cave from pieces of wood, bones, things, right? And at a certain point, by doing data, radiocarbon data, you say, hey, this horizon here is at around the younger dryas, right? Well, what do you say about that? Oh, it was a meteorite. No, no, it was a volcano. So let's test that. And by doing extremely sophisticated analysis, also using isotope uh, analysis of the osmium, 187, 186, basically they found out that there was absolutely no evidence for any extraterrestrial event, any impact. But instead, there were evidence that were compatible to a large volcanic explosion. Fine. And later on, uh, these people you now uh, studying the course from lakes all over Germany and southern, uh, northern Italy, southern Alps, lake deposit, they actually were able to trace the tephra, meaning the volcanic ashes of the Lacher Sea explosion. And what they found out, that always on top of them, uh, there was a layer of carbonized wood everywhere, in all in northern Germany, in France, in southern, carbonized wood. And so they looked at it, what is this car? And they were able to date it and came out to be 13. Point zero zero six years ago. <laughs> Actually, that, that date also came out from the fact that in the ice core, they found the same record. And so what they say, what is all this wood? So their hypothesis, their model is that this impact happened in central Germany when all the northern hemisphere was covered by forests, you know, of all kinds, but also the, uh, in Italy, you know, and that have caused that explosion, a continental sized fires. And uh, continental fire fires, what do they do? They throw into the atmosphere in the northern atmosphere a huge amount, they calculated, uh, of CO2. What does CO2 do? Does? Uh, does a greenhouse effect. And then the time, huh? and then what that causes? Well, it raises the temperature. And what does the temperature do? Uh, melts of the RTIs, eyes, uh, where the fresh light water in Maria go, goes into the Atlantic Ocean. And that will block the Gulf Stream, which will not be able to deliver the heat of the tropics to the northern uh, continent around the Atlantic Sea. So Canada, America, Europe, etc. And so there you have, boom. But that uh, drop in temperature actually, apparently, occurred, as you see the graph on the right, like 200 years after the impact of the Lacher Z. Because, of course, it needed time for this process of melting the Arctic ice. Hmm, so that's very... Anyways, there we have been now working with the Christian and with our uh, colleagues from Oxford and from, actually, from Cambridge. And, 
and basically found out that actually that tephra that we found in this cave in Frasassi was not the Lacher Z, but it was another volcano, a volcano, a super volcano, and they blow up near Naples and caused uh, this uh, formation, and that's through geochemical there, uh, that is called the uh, Napolitan Yellow Tuff. Half of Naples is built with that tuff. And here is the synthesis of what now we are working on. You see in this graph, okay, that here is, of course, this is time, and uh, here is the curve of the temperature, right? As uh, in C3 from Greenland. And uh, here we have uh, our super volcanoes, right? The first one to the left, it is around 14.5 thousand years ago, actually occurred in a place where there was a short cooling that it is called the older Dryas. Then the younger Dryas actually coincide exactly with our Lacher Z. You see it there. And that was the drop in temperature that went colder for a thousand years, colder than the last glacial maximum. And after that, the end of the last ice age, with in uh, uh, rapid uh, uh, increase of the temperature, and, and when the climate became stable, stable with just a few other important climate changes, like in the, in the late antiquity, little ice age, that is between the fifth and the sixth century AD, which also was caused by uh, super volcanoes that actually exploded in, in the Pacifics and also in the North Atlantic. So we started to see, uh, so uh, practically what happened is this, the younger dryas climate change eventually was to change the climate, you know, <laughs> the guy was making. And in fact, uh, that crisis was followed then uh, 10,000 years ago by the so-called Neolithic revolution. No, that's when agriculture, no, was uh, uh, was started, and so, and so, I say, no, what is happening today with our climate? No, could be this younger dryas, no, be an analog, since no, Lyle told us that the present is the key to the past, but today we can see that the past is the key to the future. Right? And so I say, let's call it this the climate change that is happening today, the newer dryas, right? And, and this fact that a serious thing is happening already has been known for a long time. You know? Al Gore got a Nobel Prize to actually to have us speaking out, right? With his uh, book and movie, An Inconvenient Truth. And this tells this New Yorker thing that tells you actually what is the, this, the, the situation in the world about uh, there, there is Bush, you know, you know the, the regards uh, the, the Iranians, uh, the huge threat to the planet and made a war because of that. Right? <laughs> and instead, uh, the huge threat of the planet is the climate change. Okay? You got that. So, uh, yeah, well, let's talk, let's talk about that, no? Calmly, no, calmly, because everybody looks to me that now is freaking out, right? Everybody has to become vegan, everybody has to go electric, everybody has to do this and that. Very complex situation, right? So the real cause of the new drives also, whatever happened to the Neanderthals 41,000 years ago? Let's give the four to a stalagmite from the Frasassi case. And I'm uh, doing this work with a former student of Coldy Jocker, that now is the head of the geomagnetic lab of Serge in France. And about also with a Christian that I uh, was hoping that we can get something out of this. So the Neanderthal old man, who, who is this guy? Uh, that they found in, uh, in 1857, and then more bones in uh, 1908. Uh, 
Well, that's an ape. No, this is a Cossack uh, uh, soldier. No, uh, uh, oh, and that was the time when uh, uh, people were debating Darwin uh, theory of the evolution. So this can actually be a primordial man, human. So imagine that. And uh, by uh, through the decades, actually came out that it was uh, uh, a human, right? Uh, uh, very similar uh, to the modern man, uh, different bone structure, same brain capacity, no? although the shape of the head was a little bit different, right? And that's where we got that. And, uh, and so let's look now what we know about that, where, uh, where Neanderthal came from. Well, everybody, all the uh, homo, right? in the world came from Africa, as we all know. Actually, even from little foot, no? so the white square are from Africa, the uh, green uh, squares are Eurasia, right? And you see that uh, some of these Africans uh, got out of Africa like Erectus, Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, got out of Africa no, at different times and actually spread uh, through Eurasia. And same thing, Homo sapiens, right? Uh, instead, Neanderthalensis, Neanderthal, actually, he was started, he was born in Europe. And actually, was occupying from Spain to the Urals, from UK down to the Middle East, you know? So they were, they, and they appeared 400,000 years ago. So they have their own evolution, uh, the fact of uh, Homo sapiens, that he has this, uh, this, eh, of oh, migrating. <laughs> Homo migrantis. And now, the human population 50,000 years ago, let's go. There were 70,000 individuals in Eurasia. In all Eurasia, 70,000 Neanderthals. In all the world, there were 20, 50,000 Sapiens, and few of them got out 100,000 years ago of Africa, just a few of them, and they encountered, no, encountered Neanderthal. Neanderthal always was thought it was a caveman, just living in a cave, why, of course, because they found uh, bones and artifacts of Neanderthal in caves, cave preserve, no? They didn't find them in sparse around, just in a few cases, occasionally, and as the, they were primitive, they, they were just uh, using stones and sticks. And, but this is the problem of archaeologists, because archaeologists, what they do, they, they, they work between bones and stones. And, and so when they find a rock that is being worked, you know, a stone, uh, they say, okay, this is... Uh, uh, a stone that has been uh, uh, made with this technique. And uh, so uh, it must uh, be of this age, because then the right ages cannot be done in most of the cases, especially for very old. So Homo genus started to make stone tools 2.8 million years ago. <clears throat> but in 2.8 million years, there was no much of a progression in technology. Until now, in Neanderthal time, there was this culture called Musterian, culture, technique, almost same thing, which only a little bit later actually evolved in a technique a little bit more sophisticated, and it's called Levallois. Okay, so these are the archaeologists, they are so limited. And then when the anthropology <laughs> came in to figure out <laughs> What? What? What is it? Did uh, Neanderthal practice spirituality and art, right? Now, like we do, no? So they go down in Borneo to figure out what the primitive people are doing. And because, why? Because they found a couple of instances of a Neanderthal skeleton buried in caves, of course. And then, of course, they're debating, of course, you see, that was spirituality. They, they, they put it underground because... Huh? But, and the other people say, no, they put it underground 
because a dead body, in a cave, after three days, you start to stink. And so, you, 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 what you do with it? You make a hole, you put it in the ground, so it doesn't stink. Right? Or they found recently some uh, pictoglyph, some painting in a cave, I think in France, where you can get in through a siphon, uh, it's complicated. And there, there, there was some calcite covering this vein, so they used the rainatorium dating and came out of dating that was much older than the first uh, uh, presence of Homo sapiens in Europe, and therefore that painting must have been done by Neanderthal. But there are big controversies. How accurate is the, the, the rainatorium dating? So, yeah. so, but this modern, uh, anthropologists and archaeologists like Finlayson, Manzi, Regenskai said Neanderthal were as advanced, if not more technologically and culturally than sapiens. And actually it's the sapiens that got out of Africa in various phases, started 100,000 years ago, and even they got hybridized with, uh, with Neanderthal. No, actually learn for Neanderthal how to advance in their technologies and culture. And so this is, uh, you know, uh, this is from science, right? This is basically synthetically, now common ancestor, not with Neanderthal. Uh, you have Neanderthal up and, <coughs> and uh, sapiens down. At a certain point, see, there is no time scale, but it's time in that thing. Neanderthal got hybridized with, uh, with, uh, with uh, sapiens or vice versa. And now uh, DNA studies uh, of Neanderthal by this uh, Svante Pabo, you know, who got a Nobel Prize last year, exactly for that, right? said, hmm, it was a Neanderthal man that actually inseminated uh, 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 sapiens. Uh, female. And all we today, we have two, four percent of Neanderthal in us. Although at the beginning, maybe there was much higher. And then there is what you have, you know, uh, what happened after this hybridization that before we have all these types that they're all uh, Africans, right? And after that, uh, we have uh, these Chinese and also the guy there, I don't know why they put a French guy there to, to represent what. But anyways, that's okay. So synthesis here, there is, you know? And there is our Neanderthal, right? The reconstruction, of course. And so Homo erectus is still 150,000 years. It's still 250,000 years. The Homo Neanderthal is still 41,000 years. Why? Why? Neanderthal got 41,000. It was in the middle of the Ice Age. And so here comes this paper that really struck me that I want to talk to you about quickly. So basically, you know, that the Earth is bipolar. <laughs> Not in a <laughs> psychiatric. Uh, uh, but really physically, you know, as a North Pole and a South Pole, you know? And that, that uh, fact uh, that it comes from the corner, uh, in fact, it creates around the Earth a magnetic field, right? And the magnetic field, you know, uh, is right there. The North Pole uh, uh, wa uh, magnetic wobbles a little bit. But in any case, that is the, the situation where the North Pole magnetic today closely uh, represent, uh, is uh, close to the uh, geographic North Pole, you know? And vice versa, that is what makes uh, your compass, right? Tell you where is the north, right? Okay, but in, in the deep time, eh, the uh, magnetic field of the Earth actually flips from normal to reverse and vice versa. And uh, we knew that already since the 50s, and that's uh, how we uh, interpreted the reversely uh, magnetized band oceanic cross that is continually formed at the mid-ocean ridge due to our plate tectonic and <coughs> continental drift. But only in 1977, <coughs> Alvarez Lori, they have found out a way to date the history of magnetic reversal from 
a section a gubbio, no? which is a near Quilijoco in Umbria. No? A section of layers that were covering the entire uh, Cretaceous and lower tertiary. And uh, these layers uh, are made of limestone with macrofossils, which can be dated. So they have a time scale there. And there they found the reversal pattern no? exact through hundreds of meters. Uh, uh, no, sorry. Uh, uh, exactly, here there is Gubbio, exactly the same as the one that 4,000 kilometers they found across the oceans. So for the first time, we had an age for the ocean. But now, so we have this reversal. What happened when you have a, a, a geomagnetic polar reversal? That there is no magnetic field anymore. And the magnetic field of the Earth serves as a shield, no? for the continuous solar wind, which is this production of radio nucleides and, uh, and UVs, no? they come down to Earth, there is this magnetic shield, and there they get uh, absorbed, deviated, etc., and makes in this beautiful thing like Aurora, Borealis, or, oh, very nice. But this is all radioactive particles that do not reach the surface of the Earth. Okay, so what happened when you eliminate that? When you eliminate that, this bombardment of radioactive uh, particles hit the Earth directly, as long as there is no, because during a polarity reversal, from plus to minus, at a certain point you are in the middle that is zero, and so no magnetic field. And this is this uh, uh, channels and Vigliotti figure out in this paper, it took them four years to put it together. These are geophysicists uh, uh, working in the field of uh, geomagnetic and uh, paleomagnetic. And look at this. They reconstructed the, the um, not this, uh, this one here, reconstructed the curve of the intensity of the magnetic field you know, down to 300,000 years ago. There are fluctuations, but here is where at a certain point you have a major, a major negative excursion, brief, that is called La Chance, all, which was known already for a long time by the geophysicists. And right there, 41,000 years, is where we have the Neanderthal extinction. But also the extinction of other uh, large mammals, right? Large mammals. And uh, basically, so the idea is that they say, why Neanderthal got extinct and not Homo sapiens? Uh, are we special? Yes. We are special because echo, and I'll show you, we are uh, Africans. I'll explain in a second. Now, from a stalagmite by, uh, that was a study by a student from Vienna, as a matter of fact, uh, Gerhard Kudielka, uh, that I've been studying for a long time, as a matter of fact. Finally, we got uh, uh, collecting depth spot. Uh, back in, in, in 1991, uh, I was able to see that in his uh, spellothem, there are variation in oxygen and carbon isotopes. The only thing I didn't know the time, and only later on, thanks to the student, Gerard Kudielka, and it was a Christian student, uh, they did a thesis on, on this thing on spellothem, geochronology, and paleoclimate, there actually what that came out is that he produced from this pillow theme basically six uranothorium dates, right? Saying that this pillow theme goes from 50 to 30,000 years ago. So 41,000 years ago is inside this pillow theme. And in fact, there is a date there, 41.311, right? And so I still had a piece of this stalemate and I said, cool, uh, what are you gonna do? I'm gonna send a bar of that to the Jerome Gattacheca from uh, Serge uh, um, Geomagnetic Lab. They have incredible machines there. They even have a probe. And basically, 
uh, Jerome, what he did, he basically scanned uh, this barrette with the dates and uh, put it over there, the blue curve, the intensity of the magnetic field, and this in red, the curve of the intensity that you saw in that graph of, of uh, Vigliotti and channels. And so basically, this one here record the Lachamps, okay? Lachamp excursion. What is the next step? And now I'm asking uh, Christian and other uh, people to verify <laughs> this is part of the scientific process, to test the hypothesis of uh, uh, Vigliotti and channels of Vigliotti and see if that spellothem theme actually records also an anomaly of beryllium-10 or carbon-14, which would be our solar wind radionuclei. And now, so uh, I go very, very fast. Now. So what is the real cause of the new uh, Everybody says now that the real cause is homo sapiens. But why? Huh, this is something new also. That happened that, that these people uh, in uh, Dresden, I think, and Max Planck, figured out that uh, uh, there was a mutation in the brain of homo sapiens. There are something point affected this gene, TKTL1, and uh, where this uh, thin uh, RG9 appear, and then controls the production of neurons in the frontal cortex. What it means? Means that if uh, before they had a computer, you uh, know, a Mac Plus with 20 megabyte, you know, now they have an iBook with uh, five gigabytes, uh, right? Because now that the brain became bigger, but it became <laughs> incredibly bigger. And this thing they didn't find in uh, Neanderthal. In Neanderthal, the same gene TKTL1 has a different kind of thing, which is lysine and, and evolution. So they, uh, they said, and they've been studying this thing for a long time. I say, cool. So what is the hypothesis? Now I say, could it be that De La Champ bombardment 41,000 years ago eh? caused a, a carcinogenic pandemic to uh, the African, uh, to the Neanderthal, simply because they have different genes. They, they, they have no melanin. Homo sapiens have melanin. The African black homo sapiens, the red hair, blue eyes, and white skin Neanderthal has a different kind of uh, genetic uh, defenses, immunitarian defenses. And so they basically done in a carcinogenic pandemic in a few generations. Whereas Homo sapiens somehow survived, got affected, but we are here. So meaning that they managed because we are African, right? And it could be that the La Champ has caused, and this is the last slide, I promise. They cause that mutation. And so here, I'm going to read it. Human together implies greater neurogenesis in front of the recording. New hypothesis to be tested. See, in science, if you have an hypothesis that you cannot test it, it's not an hypothesis. It's just throw it away. Could be tested if <laughs> time, time permitting. Now, the radionuclear bombardment following the Leichamp uh, geomagnetic event drove to extinction the Neanderthals at the hands of a carcinogenic pandemic, but also trigger a genetic mutation of the gene TKTL1 in surviving sapiens consequences. Sapiens became smarter and smarter and smarter. So they rapidly develop new technologies and evolving cult cultures, Arvignation, Gravetian, Epigravetian. At the end of Epigravetian, which is the end of the younger dryas, right? This made them overcome the younger dryas, right? Yes, climate crisis. After which they made the Neolithic revolution, establishment of economic, political, and religious power. Economic means surplus, capitalism. Political, imperialism, war. Religious. Creationism, 
obscurantism. Okay? Which is the powers that are today governing humankind, the humanity on earth. With the difference that instead of being 200,000 people, we are 8.5 billion people. <laughs> and so the newer drives, I want to call it climate change. And this is, thank you very much for, for having me invited me to say this. So, uh, from uh, the Frasasi caves to the geomagnetic reversals, there we now have a chance to channel our inner Neanderthal and ask Sander some questions. Uh, who wants to start? There's a microphone going around. Anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts? Okay, please, here in the second row. Yes, grazie. Yeah, thank you so much for your interesting lecture. Um, I, have, I found a little difference uh, in your lecture and one of the slides uh, because I'm, I would be more in favor to see Neanderthals uh, as uh, Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis. So, because they in interbreed it, so are the same species. Uh, sapiens and uh, sapiens sapiens and sapiens neanderthalensis. What is your uh, opinion about that? Um, before uh, Homo sapiens, right, who was uh, appeared in Africa 250, 300,000 years ago, and started to get out of Africa, Homo sapiens, uh, starting 100,000 years it's not that there were now people coming with, uh, with inflatable boats, you know, and there were few people, you know, during the beginning of the Ice Age, you know, that was easy to get into the Middle East, right? Uh, just few people. They had the first encounters with uh, Neanderthals that were there for 400,000 years. And those were not Africans. Neanderthals were European, right? Then, and we know that, thanks to Pabe, now Svante, exactly how Neanderthal were made with skin, called DNA, uh, genes. You know. There was their, uh, <laughs> I used to call it, boonga boonga. There was their inbreeding, you know, uh, breeding. Uh, but again, it would have been... Uh, then, from 100,000 years, first exit of Sapiens African to, uh, let's say, 50,000 years ago, when a few of these uh, 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 Homo sapiens, which could have been uh, hybridized, you know, already hybrid, with inside hybridized, they, they arrived to Europe, but in the meantime, they arrived also in Eurasia. They arrived... Uh, all the way to Siberia, to China, right? So there was this thing of a few, very few, uh, uh, maybe hundreds or thousands. In a, uh, maybe the inbreeding became, uh, continued, right? Who knows? <laughs> it's diff difficult to, what it was uh, the, uh, what do you call, uh, the social life of these people uh, then. And so it's not that by saying Homo neand uh, sapiens neandertalensis. Sorry to say that. There is not such a thing. There is Homo neandertalensis. And in fact, the, the, what the, these people in uh, the uh, pub found out when I said it was a male, that, uh, and also those books that uh, Flea and Stone said, Beautiful books, so modernly written, so well referenced, and these are people that have been working on this thing for a long time. That basically, uh, uh, a male sapiens that, how can I say, fertilized <laughs> a female Neanderthal, the female Neanderthal would not be, have been able to actually 
carry the pregnancy in the uh, society that uh, she was. That's is explained in those books. I cannot tell you what are the detailed technical reasons for that. And instead, vice versa, the, the, the female African sapiens pregnant with, uh, with that would have actually brought ahead the pregnancy, the birth, and the raising of the... That's what I, I understood. Do we have any other questions? Yes, please. All right. The microphone. Um, about this uh, effect of neurogenesis, yeah? Yeah. In the Neanderthal and in the Homo sapiens, which uh. you explained was different, yeah? Possibly different. Uh -huh. uh, now, the question is the effect of the diminished uh, magnetic field of the Earth, yeah? The increase of of, of cosmic rays yes. had an effect on the uh, on the atmosphere itself. Yes. So uh, it produced uh, radicals and 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 geo yeah. and uh, chemistry is going on in the atmosphere, mm. which then affected even the ozone layer, as far as I know. And mm -hmm. I, I looked at this big paper of Vilotti, which yeah. is very long paper. <laughs> yeah, they wanted the, the, the channels and yes, 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 yes. Very and long so they, and complicated, yeah. Very complicated. Mm -hmm. and, but they argue that eventually the ultraviolet radiation increased to an extent that it affected uh, the Neanderthal in a different way because he was uh, light-skinned yeah. compared to the Homo sapiens, yeah. uh, sort of the African dark uh, complexion and I think this is uh, what uh, what these yeah. guys discuss in, in their papers. Yeah, I've been discussing this with uh, Luigi Villotti, mm. which I happen to be a visiting uh, researcher mm. at Berkeley in the, in the mid '80s in our group with Alvarez. And I, of course, when I read that paper, I, I contacted him, and we were been talking about that. Yeah. Now, uh, my my uh, question uh, is, how is that? You indicated that this uh, this theory that uh, the Neurogenesis in the uh, in but, the brain is being affected. Is that being established, for, or is that being uh, investigated by neurogenesis? It should be investigated. I wrote to the Pinsen et al. Uh -huh. with a simple, simple question by a geologist, of course. Mm -hmm. Say, is there any way to establish when the date? Right. Of this. Okay. Yes, yes, that would, would be great. Answer, yeah. Of course. <laughs> so now with Vigliotti, we are working on that. How uh -huh. can we figure out? Of course, Neanderthal got extinct 41,000 years ago because of La Chambre, right? Yeah. So what would be the most uh, simple approach? Is to check the database of Homo sapiens. And, uh, and of course, Neanderthal, sorry, uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals uh, prior to 41,000 years. And then, of course, you can't do the same thing, but they did it on Homo sapiens after 41,000 years. Not a Neanderthal because there were no Neanderthal. Right. And so no, you no. cannot actually see if there was. So that, that is the test. And you can do that by consulting the databases, which you need a, a very good, a specialized person in doing that, looking and reading you know, all, the, the, all the genes, the proteins, the things, which, uh, of course, I know nothing about. But it's not only the Neanderthal was affected, all the others. Yes, that is what I, because they say that, right? Yes. There's a, and in fact, I was thinking, hmm, uh, let's see what, what other species may have been affected. Mm -hmm. uh, I just learned uh, very recently, for instance, the uh, Canis lupus, the gray wolf, mm -hmm. right, actually, is the, is the origin of Canis lupus familiaris, which is our dog, right? Mm -hmm. So all the dogs are coming from Canis lupus, the gray wolf. But the domestication of uh, oh. Canis lupus familiar occurred you know, 40,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
So I said, hmm. <laughs> so I'm going to get my dog. And my dog is easy because there are only four neurons. You know? <laughs> Food, Red Bull, sleeping, and petting. <laughs> but maybe he's going to give us an answer on that. <laughs> All right. Do we have any more formal questions up here? Or do you want to reserve some informal questions for downstairs? With a drink in your hand. Okay, one more formal question. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, oh, I, I would see. be interested in the paleo seismological uh, results. Mm. Uh, well, it's that's in progress, uh, in the sense that that requires a, a certain number of uranium thorium dating, and. Um, I gave everything in the hand of a former student, Collegio Oco, that now is a North Carolina State University. And he has a lab where he does a clumped isotopes, but of course he has connection also to uranium thorium labs. And these things are very expensive and also takes time in the sense, uh, Ethan, did you finish through the, oh, the machine broke and we are waiting for her to be, oh, no, no, no. oh here there was the pandemic. Oh, no. So patience, you know, it is going on. And oh, not only that, but if you notice the very first slide when I showed the huge room, you know, one million cubic meter, the bottom of the room is just breccia. You not make a breach. It, there are even other rooms that there are actually mega boulders as big as half of this room. Oh, these were all collapses, right? And w what makes it collapse? Yeah, if not a, si a big seismic event. Did all this thing happen at the same time or not? And some of these things have a new spell thing growing on top, or they got cemented, or there were pieces of, of the vault that had, uh, um, I don't know, like uh, veils, or what do you call it, the cell spell themes, they actually knocked down, and now is horizontal, you know, that we can date that and uh, start, start to have a cloud of point to figure out whether these seismic uh, events actually happen different times or in one big time, which I started to suspect. Uh. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sandra, for this uh, very varied presentation that lead us uh, from all kinds of topics, one to the next. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank the staff at the Academy, especially Victor Pokman and Kai Minstag and our technical team here for all the support. And you can re- Visit this presentation here on the Academy website in about a couple of weeks. So thank you very much. And let's meet downstairs. There will be some drinks available. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, Christian.